Before we begin our study of the Word of God today, um, let us enter into a time of prayer with um, God. So, Father, we just come to you. I'm reminded that as our friends are gathered together to study your Word, um, I'm reminded, of Father, of what we've talked about many times, of what we've given up. Um, basically, the time that we've given up that everybody that is here studying, listening to your word, could be somewhere else. And so, Father, I pray that you would help each of us to redeem the time that we've spent studying your word, listening to your word. As Jesus said, let those who have an ear to hear, hear. Um, but for the time that we're spending listening to your word, Father, it's time that we could be and often would be doing something else. And so, Father, I pray that you would honor our time of studying by allowing us to redeem that time. And, Father, I'm reminded of how limited our time is. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to redeem this time to your glory and to our benefit. In Jesus' name. I am reminded of how limited time is and what a gift time is, that God has given us time and how time is encapsulated by eternity. On both sides of time is eternity. We have eternity past, that before God entered us into time as human beings, there was an eternity past where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit eternally existed together. And after time no longer exists, there is an eternity coming, an eternity future where God the Father, God the Son, and those that he redeemed will live together forever, that we will live for him. When God created time and created humans, he placed Adam in a garden so that man, humanity, could exist with God. <clears throat> and we could experience and love him and live with him. Uh, but something violently went wrong. Um, humanity failed at our mission. <clears throat> And God himself came down, entered into time and space to fix what we had broken. God himself, in his love and in his mercy and in his divine wisdom, invaded time and space. And Jesus came down in that first advent, in what we call the Christmas story. And he invaded time and space to come down to be one of us to fix what we had broken, to fix us, to fix you, to fix me, so that we might be redeemed, so that we might be able to spend eternity with him. And then when we swing out into eternity, well, we know that one day when we were are resurrected and we will spend eternity with him, that we will live forever with him in a new eternity, in a new heaven, um, in a garden we will spend with God. Um, but in the meantime, in the meantime, um, whenever you hear that in the meantime, I always think about, well, what surrounds in the meantime? There's something more important on this side of the me in the meantime and something more important on that side of in the meantime. Um, I remember when I was diagnosed with cancer, the doctors, well, in the meantime, uh, well, in the meantime was before I had the treatment, before I had surgery and the chemotherapy. Well, in the meantime, do this, this, and this. Well, on the one side of it was, well, in the meantime, you have cancer. And in the meantime, you know, you're going to have this, this, and this, and hopefully a recovery. Uh, but in the meantime, do this, this, and this. Right? So we live right now in between the two advents, right? Christ came into the world some 2,000 years ago. He lived the perfect life. He died on the cross, he was resurrected, and then he ascended into heaven, right? And now what? Now what? Well, we are waiting for his second return, that second advent. So we live in between advents. So we are in between the first advent and the second advent. We are in the meantime, or in the between time. Um, in the meantime, or in the between time. So if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles with me to Galatians 4, 4. We're going to be taking a look at Galatians 4.4, 4, reading from that today in our study. And the Bible, the Word of God says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. But when the fullness of time had come, so I want to talk today a little bit about what that fullness of time is. Uh, you notice one thing about Jesus when he came into the world, that Jesus was never in a hurry. He was never late. He was always right on time and never, ever in a hurry. Unlike me, unlike my life, and if your life is anything like mine, probably unlike you. I find myself often in a hurry, often scampering about, often running late. Um, time seems to sometimes master my calendar. And so as I'm living this life, learning to be more like Jesus, I'm learning how to not be in a hurry, how to not be worried, um, how to not be mastered by time, but how to experience life. Um, and how to live in between time, how to experience life the way Jesus is. And part of that is learning how to give up the control and learning to that God has a plan, uh, that God is in this. God, God has got this. Uh, God will see this through. God has made some promises and that there, there is a story. The Bible tells us that God has a plan and we get to enter into that story. We get to enter into that narrative. Uh, there is an end and a beginning, and the end and the beginning is the present. God's promises are beginning to be fulfilled through Jesus. And Jesus has already begun to fulfill them, and they are already fulfilled. Uh, you may have heard this saying, if you've been around the church enough, already, not yet. God's promises are beginning to be fulfilled through Jesus, already but they're not yet complete but the end is already guaranteed the promises are already done the end has already been brought into the present so why do i need to worry why do i need to hurry why do i need to scamper about and worry about anything if god is in control why do i not just need to do what i need to do today to bring glory to god and do make the right, worthy, righteous choice that God puts before me today and leave the rest up to him. Be obedient to his word today <clears throat> and leave the rest up to him. Leave the consequences up to God and know that it's already been done. God has made promises he will fulfill through Jesus that he's already set and accomplished. God has worked in the past. God is working in the present and God will work in the future. I don't have to do it. So as we think about this Advent season, there are many things that we can tie into this, um, but what God tells us that in the fullness of time, but in the fullness of time, Paul says in Galatians, and I'm reminded of my mother. When I was a young boy growing up, my mother had this, in our house, our living room, there was a big glass window in the living room, and my mother kept an imm immaculate house, very clean, <clears throat> and she would, on the weekends, clean that window. But she would clean it in the morning, maybe around 9, and she would clean it. But at noon, she would go to check it. And the reason she would go to check it at noon is because that's when the sunlight was at its highest. And she could see any streak or any spot that was missing. And at high noon, high noon in the Bible, I believe, is when Jesus hung on the cross. See, the whole Old Testament points forward to the day that Jesus hung on that cross at Calvary. That is the fullness of Christ. And God, from Genesis forward to Calvary, he moved heaven and hell for that event to happen. He moved nations and states, and he moved and worked through human history to, to that one 
historical event of Christ dying on the cross at the exact moment that it happened so that the world would be redeemed and redeemable. God did that for us. That's high noon. That is the fullness of time that, God, that Paul is speaking of in Galatians. In the fullness of time, God brought forth his son. And everything in the Old Testament looks forward to that moment. And everything in the New Testament looks back to that moment. But also points forward to the second coming of Christ. Everything. So as we're in this Advent season, may we look back to the events of Scripture going all the way back to Genesis and remembering Genesis 3.15 when God makes that first proto-evangelium. He makes that first promise to Adam and Eve that he was going to send somebody that was going to crush the head of Satan. In Genesis 3.15, God made a promise. And then God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis 12.1. He made a promise to Abraham he promised him land, and uh, that land promise that developed into the Palestinian covenant in Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 10. He promised him a seed. Here was Abraham, an old man that was barren, and Sarah, but he promised him a seed that developed into the Davidic promise and the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel seven twelve, And he also promised him that he would be a blessing to all nations, that developed into the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, 31, that he would bless all nations. And he worked through the nation of Israel to fulfill that, bringing forth the birth of Jesus. Um, he brought forth Jesus out of Israel. And Jesus Christ came into the world, born in a stable. And just as Jesus' first coming changed the world, his second coming will also change the world. And just as Christians, and we look back during this time, this Advent season that we celebrate, that we're in the midst of celebrating, and we look back with such joy, and we sing songs like joy to the world. And may we be a light to a darkened world, telling them about Christ, telling them about our Lord. May we remember everything that God did to move and make the world right so that his son, our savior, our Lord, and our king could come into this world to save you, to save me, and to die for everyone else and that we have that message. May we take that gift and give it to the world this season. <clears throat> but may we remember that Christmas is just as much about his second coming and God fulfilling his promise. Um, remember in Mark 1.15, God says, the time promised by God um, see, God is doing something. See, that old creation, right? God created the world. And Adam failed. And it's fading away. Satan entered in. And he tempted Adam. And Adam fell. And that old creation. Um, but God is doing something new. There's a new creation. And they overlap. And we live in a time of overlap now. And it gets confusing for people, right? Because they look around and they say, well, if God is in control, why is the world the way it is? Uh, because God hasn't done away with the old creation. And the new creation, it's, it's, God is working the new creation, but there's an overlap. There, were, there will be a day when it's just the new creation when it's just righteousness, there will be no evil. God will do away with evil. Um, but right now, God is slow to anger. God is long-nosed. He is, he is gracious. And he is giving us the opportunity as the church <clears throat> to share the gospel. It is not for us to do away with evil. 
Um, God will do that. It is not for us to judge evil. It is not for us to tear up all the weeds, right? And in Matthew 13, uh, when he tells the parable of the weeds and the wheat, um, God doesn't tell us to go tear up the weeds because he says you'll destroy the weeds also. He says, let them sit together. And at the end, um, when it's time for the harvest, then they'll be separated. It's our job just to plant more weeds, wheat, more wheat. The wheat will grow with the weeds. So we should share the good news. We are to be ambassadors of the good news that Jesus came the first time, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Lord and Savior. The good news of the Advent season is that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. He is not just a get out of hell or get out of jail free card. He is God. He is the very one who created you. He is the one who died to redeem you and save you. He is the one who died to save us. He is the one who gives us new life. He is the one who overcame life. When Jesus came and lived the perfect life, he dealt with sin. When Jesus died on the cross, he put sin to death. When he was buried, he buried sin. And when he rose up out of the grave, he dealt with death, our final enemy. And he overcame death so that we might have a life and life everlasting. So that we who are in Christ, who are his followers, now have life and have it more abundantly. We are children of life. All of our, the judgment of sin was placed on him 2,000 years ago at Calvary. That is the gift of Christmas. That is the gift of Christmas, that you carry no sin, all of your sin, past, present, and future, has been placed on Jesus Christ, and you are free. Paul says that you are no longer a slave, but you are now sons of God and inherit the kingdom. Why? Because your sin has been dealt with and you are free. By the grace of God, you have been set free and you inherit the world. The world belongs to you and me, not by anything that you have done or anything that I have done, but by what our Lord and Master has done, making us sons of God that we might call him Father and inherit the world that he made for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for giving to us what you've made for us, that you've given to us our inheritance. What you made for us, you have given to us through your son who died for us. We no longer have to struggle uh, because you came into this world and died for us. And you came on your first coming to save sinners. But you will come again. And when you come, you will condemn sinners. So Lord, it is my prayer that those that are listening today would come to receive you as Lord and Saviors, would come to receive you today as your, their Lord and Savior, uh, so that they would be redeemed from sin. Because you came the first time to redeem Savior sinners. But you are coming again, and when you come the second time, you will come to condemn those who sin. Who sin. Lord, you came the first time to shed your blood. But when you come the second time, and he is coming, you will come to shed in your enemy's blood. Christ came the first time riding humbly on a donkey. But when he comes a second time, he will be riding on a white horse. When he came the first time, he came and he was bound. And the devil thought he had victory over him. But when he comes the second time, Jesus will have the devil bound and thrown into that lake of fire. 
when Christ came the first time, after that in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. But when Christ comes the second time, Babylon will be destroyed. Jesus came the first time as the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God, to lay down his life and die. But when he comes the second time, he's coming as the Lion of Judah. When he came the first time, he was rejected by the Jews and received by the Gentiles. But in his second coming, he will be rejected by the Gentiles and received by the Jews as their Messiah. When he came the first time, the Jewish kingdom, the Jewish people, they turned down the kingdom offer for this world. But when he comes the second time, he will come as the king of Jews and rule this world. He will rule this world from Jerusalem. When he came the first time, Jesus came unnoticed. When he comes the second time, every eye will see him. He will come on those Shekinah glory clouds and every eye will see him coming down. Every eye will see him. He came humble in a stable. He's going to come as king of king and lord of lords. He came down suffering and humility. He's going to come in glory and power. He came down despised and rejected. He's going to come down to rule and reign. He came to save those who would come to him. And when he comes a second time, he will gather together those. He will no longer be in a manger, but he will sit on a throne. He will not wear a crown of thorns, but he will wear many crowns and rule and reign in this earth and make all things right. And my question is, do you recognize who Jesus is today? Because in his first coming, Jesus came into the world. Jesus came into the world. He came into the world. And the world sees him. The world sees him. Okay, when he came into the world in his first coming. And then he suffered for our sins at Calvary. And then Jesus comes again after his resurrection. And the church sees him. And then he was taken up. But at his second coming, Jesus is going to come for his church. The church will see him. And then the church is taken up. And then there's a time of tribulation. And then Jesus comes again and the world sees him and he's going to judge the world. But I'm telling you, Jesus was, he came into this world as a gift to save us. And he is the only thing that can save us. We cannot save ourselves. We're not that smart. We don't have that ability. He is the only plan of salvation that gives life. He is the only plan that brings people to God. He is the only plan that comes from God. So my question today for each of us, is what is it that you are counting on when you swing out into eternity, what is it that you're counting on when you stand before God in eternity that's going to get you to the other side? And I'm telling you, it is the gift of Christmas. It is the gift of the first advent it's the baby Jesus in the manger, but it is the gift of the second advent. It is the Lord Jesus, the King of King, and the Lord of Lord. And I pray that whoever you are, wherever you are, that you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and that you will have the greatest Christmas gift that anyone could ever have. And more importantly, that you will give the greatest Christmas gift that anyone could ever give, and that is our Lord Jesus. May the gift of Christmas be with you, and may you have him already and not yet, and may you enjoy him 
from eternity to eternity, and in the meantime and in between time. Amen.